There you go. Thank you very much. So now you have an overview of how we started and our concept here at the National Museum of American Indian. Now how that plays, uh, Dr. Adrian Cercero, who is, his work is Weave Scholarship and Real World Practice to Explore Sustainable Development in Communities. He brought together the zoo and this philosophy, and he is here to explain to you how he did it. Dr. Cercero. I'm so happy to be here. This is such a long time coming. Um, the year 2000, when they were working in the beginning of the process of putting together this museum, I was a fellow at the National Zoo, working on uh, interpretation and education and teaching about conservation and um, conservation biology. And, and I saw in um, not just an opportunity to tell a story that is not told normally in the history of the United States, but the great potential to change the way that the business of museum education is done because of the way in Native American United States, there is all of this diversity of not just knowledge, but of ways of transferring knowledge and I saw in the experiential practices and in the way that uh, knowledge is interwoven in the everyday life and the way that it is about spirituality as much as it is about knowledge and it is about beauty as much as it is about concepts and information, the opportunity of really activating what makes informal education and museums uh, a valuable tool for learning. So I've been exploring that question loosely for a long time and the reason I'm beginning with the, what's usually the end, saying thank you, is because this is our opportunity to say thank you to the National Museum of the American Indian for providing the guidance on the practice of first voices interpretation. And what we're going to do with the rest of the afternoon is show you a, a uh, project in which we applied that knowledge and that experience in the uh, process of putting together the polar bear exhibition at the San Luis Zoo. So thank you, all of you. <laughs> Two days ago I was uh, not joking, being totally serious with my uh, colleagues that my slides were all going to be white, just white, white rectangles. And, and of course, <laughs> yeah, that's what that, was, that has been their face all throughout. But it's an important point to be made. Uh, when I, f I grew up in Puerto Rico, I saw snow for the first time when I was 18. And when I flew, uh, traveled to the Arctic the first time, this is what I saw when I was in front of an ice sheet. Um, and just white, just a lot of white. It, there was no, no way of making sense of that. And it was in the collaboration and in the conversations with the elders and the hunters that the landscape starts revealing uh, itself to you. And all of a sudden, what just looks like a white sheet of paper starts gaining resolution. <coughs> and all of a sudden, what seems to have nothing has a lot of things, sometimes way too many things. Um, and so <laughs> from nothing to a lot, and then it takes the wisdom of a real uh, seasoned hunter or somebody who knows the community to be able to not just see all of that's there, but to figure out the best way to go from point A to point B, the safest way, the clearest way. And I think that's a good metaphor for this project, because when we started the project, it was, again, just blank space. No way of making sense of how do we tell the story of a polar bear in a way that approaches all of these topics that are present in an appropriate way. So we went from nothing to way too much information. 
And how do we make sense of that? And so what I'm going to do now is, as a way of framing the next uh, presentations, tell you how we took all of that information and made a path from the beginning of the story to where the story is at now. And I'm just going to mostly be framing it. My colleagues are actually going to be telling the story. Two of them are uh, working out of the San Luis Zoo uh, first, and then now University, uh, Michigan State University. Um, our friend uh, Steven is at the Arctic Studies Center. Uh, our uh, native colleague uh, Jack Omelak is in Alaska looking at us right now. So you can wave at him, and he'll be speaking about that. Um, anyway, so, and we'll show that path. So the path begins with the, an opportunity. The San Luis Zoo was uh, about to build a new exhibition on climate, I mean on polar bears. They, there had been a bear uh, for a long time, a much beloved pair of polar bears at the San Luis Zoo. They died when they were doing planning for new exhibitions. Everybody wanted a new polar bear exhibition. But of course, that was many years ago, and now that they were thinking about a new polar bear, the topic of climate change became a really important topic, and the extinction of the polar bears became, became a really important topic. And so how do we weave together those two things? At that moment, uh, I was the conservation education research director at the zoo, and it was my responsibility to try to figure out the answer to that question. How do we tell a story about climate change that is not alienating and it creates the conditions for movement forward in conservation. The other opportunity that arose is that this little bear, Kali, was brought into a village called Kali. Uh, it will be pronounced appropriately by my colleagues. Uh, apparently I cannot say that word. Um, Kali the bear goes to Kali the village, which is also known as Point Lay in Alaska. And from that village, Brought, is brought to the Anchorage Zoo, and it becomes possible for the San Luis Zoo to have access to that bear. And so when we were thinking about all of this, I thought, I remembered these moments of working and collaborating with the NMAI, and I thought, why do we have to tell the story? Why don't we invite the people that are actually part of the community of Cali to help us put together the story? Um, so. Uh, and as we're doing that, why don't we acknowledge that the topic of climate change is very fraught in a place like the Midwest and create the conditions to have a different kind of con conversation, a conversation that is about building rather than about the things that we disagree on, about the things that we all consider important and we want to build upon, this idea of sustainable development. So how do we combine first voices, sustainable development, and create something that recognizes the dignity not just of the people that we are talking to in St. Louis and in the Midwest, but also the people that we are uh, collaborating with up north. So I called my colleague and friend, uh, Vilma Ortiz, here at the NMAI, and she said, well, here's a telephone number of somebody that you might want to get in touch with. Um, and that was Igor Krupnik and Steven at the um, Arctic Studies Center. And I basically, sort of dropped by, <laughs> that was a really fun day. And we began a conversation, and they introduced me to uh, Jack Omelak and the Alaska Nanook Commission, which is the native entity that works with polar bears. Jack and I began a conversation, and his colleagues in Alaska, a conversation that actually lasted a year. One difference between what we did at the San Luis Zoo and what the NMAI does is that we are not a native institution. So it, was, it wasn't just a matter of representing a native institution representing native communities, but, also, but this is a matter of non-native institutions creating collaborations and being able to host native perspectives. So it required a much longer and more thoughtful, and I call it a much more awkward conversation. Uh, so we spent a whole year having awkward conversations and trying to align are thinking and getting to know each other to first decide if there was a project to be done. So these topics of traditional knowledge and subsistence and resilience and community and surprisingly science came up over and over and over again. So 
out of that came an opportunity to, uh, came, came this idea af after a year of talking of putting together an, an exhibition that would uh, be hosted by the San Luis Zoo, but would belong to the communities where the bear came from. And it would be about science, uh, and we would do it in collaboration with the tribal governments. Lisa is going to explain in more detail how that ended up playing, playing itself out. But the word beauty is in that path because the most beautiful thing that happened in this whole process is that when we were trying to figure out how are we going to talk to these communities, the idea came up uh, uh, by Jack and, and our colleagues in the North uh, that instead of trying to contrive some complicated scheme, we should go up there and teach like the zoo teaches in St. Louis. And so the reason this uh, symposium is called Zebras in the Arctic is because we ended up, Lisa and I ended up going to these northern villages. And while I was doing the political work with Jack of, of figuring out if we could work with these communities on the exhibition, Lisa was in the schools teaching all of the kids in the school about African animals. And she will show you pictures. We brought collections of a, a crate full of skins and materials from Eastern Africa, which included zebra skins. Uh, it was a beautiful a moment of beauty, and it helped us recognize that the stories to be told are not just about showing a microphone in people's faces and asking them how climate change is going to end it all, but it has to do with telling the story of how this is beautiful and has to be preserved. Anyway, so bringing it back to the zoo, and again, you'll get to hear more details about that, it has to do also with interpretation that is counterintuitive in the sense that it doesn't become precious about just dog sleds because most of the people in these communities up north also have snowmobiles. And we wanted people in St. Louis to walk to the exhibition and have that moment where they look at things that look like their world and they can say, uh, oh, wait, this is not that different. There, there are points of connection that we can use to get to know each other. Um, so the bear is now at the zoo and there are many things that happen related to, to education and kids etc. that will also be discussed. But I wanted to end with this part. Um, many things came out of that. Kelly is going to be talking about projects, scholarly projects that are coming out of the, the work. Uh, but I wanted to, to show you the path again because one of the things that is really in, in interesting and important about all of this is that as we're rescuing that memory, not just the memory of what it was for the people in Alaska, but I got asked by an elder, why is this important to you? And, uh, and my answer was, this is about my kids remembering. Because we have forgotten. We have forgotten here so many things that you have kept obstinately remembering for us. So it's time to have these conversations so that we can all remember it together. So that's the beginning of that. But the beginning of that also has to do with preparing for the uncertainty. Because all of these conversations with elders and hunters in front of the eyes began with learning about the characteristics of the eyes, but they always got to this sentence. And then 20 years ago, and then 20 years ago, the eyes started changing in a way that doesn't make sense to us anymore. And then 20 years ago, it started moving in a way that makes it dangerous to go hunting. And then 20 years ago, things have been changing in a way that makes our world that we have known for 5,000 years unrecognizable. So. Not only are we remembering the ways that make our life more interesting and, and more connected to conservation, but it's also all of us getting ready for the uncertainty that is being presented to us by climate change and an opportunity for learning, to learning together how to move forward. And thank you again.